Next up for us is the integumentary system, or the integument or skin. I'm going to take a broad view here first. Point out that one of the first things we're going to do is functions of the integumentary system. We'll then look at structure. So the two, maybe three different layers of the skin. So technically there's the epidermis, the dermis, and then the hypodermis is not, and then the hypodermis is not really part of the skin. It's below the skin. But we will break those down. Look at skin appearance. Those are going to be things like skin markings, linger lines, skin coloring. We'll look at accessory structures. So we'll look at glands, nails, and hair. Then we'll look at cancer. We'll look at the three main types of skin cancer. So basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma. And then we'll get into burns. Burns gets pretty complex because there's a lot of different classification systems. So the two main classification systems are superficial to full thickness or first degree, second degree, third degree, and fourth degree. We're gonna kind of put those together into an amalgam, so we're gonna kind of put those together. Superficial, partial thickness, and then full thickness is what we'll do. Let's start looking through the functions of the integumentary system. So I'm a visual person, so I need to come up with some kind of image that helps me remember each of these functions. I don't know what you think about the TSA, but they definitely limit entry and exit to certain places like airports and things like that. And that's definitely what the skin does too. It's a barrier that protects you from chemical, physical, and mechanical harm. So those could be chemicals or acids that you fill on your skin. Could be a cut like a knife. Could be trauma, so a mechanical barrier as well. Skin also plays a role in body temperature regulation. The main place that it does that is dilation of blood vessels in the skin to let blood go to the skin. So then you'll radiate off heat. Or also, you can constrict the blood vessels in your skin to allow the blood to go deeper into you, not go out to the skin and lose heat. There's additional things there too, like sweat glands help to cool the body. Cutaneous sensation gives you information about the outside world. Some of that information could do you harm like a mosquito. So cutaneous sensation also plays a role in your immune system. Metabolic functions, the skin makes vitamin D. That vitamin D then passes through the kidney where it becomes an active form of vitamin D that helps you absorb calcium. And you've probably heard me say this several times, hear me say this several other times, is that calcium is an on switch in the body. Calcium allows neurons to talk to other neurons. Calcium controls heart rate, heart strength. Calcium is necessary for muscle contraction, both skeletal and smooth. When sperm meets egg, calcium waves go across. So the skin has a pretty big function in making sure that the body has calcium. Blood reservoir, if you're not active and your muscles aren't really using a lot of blood or you don't need to send a bunch of blood to the brain or the autonomic nervous system is not demanding blood to make you smarter to get away from a threat, well, you store that extra blood then, about 5% of it, in your skin when it's not being used. Excretion, you might get rid of nitrogenous waste or other waste products through sweat. So that's our beginning. We're going to go to structure next. The structure is there's three layers. There's the epidermis. Epa means above. So that's the outermost, most superficial region. The dermis is the middle, so shown over here on the right. And then the hypodermis. The hypodermis is not necessarily part of the skin because it's below the dermis, below the skin. But we'll still cover it here because there's no other place really to cover it. Epidermis. So the outermost portion. Several cells, four different cells, I guess, but a lot of different keratinized stratified squamous. And if you look, they tend to change their shape as they dry out and move out. So this is a superficial area. This is down deeper. We'll get to those cell types in the next slide. So keratinocytes are the main cells that make up your skin. Those are all the yellow guys here. Using this text from OpenStax, using the figures from OpenStax because they're Creative Commons and then I can put these files on YouTube. One of the things I'm disappointed is they don't show the longer hand cells. Maybe your textbook, if you have a different textbook, shows these. These are immune cells that lie down in here and any bacteria that does manage to make it through here will get attacked by the longer hand cells. Melanocytes, trying to color code here to the figure, so that's why it's kind of in this light gray. Melanocytes produce melanin. Melanin makes you tan and protects you from the UV rays of the sun. Merkel cells are touch cells. Depending on where you look, your skin is a little bit different in the palm of your hand, in the sole of your feet, and in those areas you actually have five layers of skin. But everywhere else, you have four layers of skin. So you have the stratum corneum, stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, and the stratum basale or basal layer. You might notice that I skipped over the stratum lucidum. That's the layer that's in the palm of your hand and the sole of your feet. Makes your skin a little bit different on the palm of your hand versus the back of your hand. So the deepest or basal layer kind of sounds like basement. So the basement is the lowest layer of your house. The basal layer is the lowest layer of your skin. It's the deepest, firmly attached to the dermis, which we'll cover in a second. Single row of the youngest keratinocytes and they're undergoing rapid mitosis to divide because they're going to feed the cells that are going to rise up through this layer, dry out and die and become the outermost layers of the skin. 
Next layer up, stratum spinosum, or spiny layer. It has these cells that are really kind of spiny, and that's why it's called the spinosum. Melanin granules are here, and this is where the Langerhans cells hang out too. Granulosum or granular layer. So here the cells are starting to dry out and they're kind of starting to look kind of punctate or they have little granules in them. So thin, three to five layers. They're really starting to dry out, so there's a drastic change here. Palm of your hand, sole of your feet, you have the stratum lucidum. Consists of flat, dead keratinocytes, and it's really only present in, like I said, thick skin on the sole of your feet and the palm of your hand. And it's pretty translucent, that's why it's called the lucidum, as in like light passes through it. Top layer is the corneum, or sometimes it's called the horny layer. Outermost layer of keratinized cells, three quarters, most of the most of the numbers of cells in the epidermis are in the corneum. So clearly it's not the thickest layer, but it has the most number of cells because these cells have dried out and died at this point. Really good for waterproofing. Also, you can lose these cells, like if you get scratched and still have a barrier, so they're great for protection against abrasion and penetration. And since they're dead, they're the ones that protect you from biological, chemical, and physical assaults. So that's the epidermis. Moving down to the dermis. So we see over here on the right the dermis. So the skin consists of three different regions. We just did the epidermis, now we're doing the dermis. And the dermis consists of two layers itself. So there's what's called a papillary layer. Papillary means bumps, or like little fingers. And then down below, is there's, there's a reticular layer. And if you remember your histology, you'll know that this is composed of a lot of, giving you a chance to answer, dense irregular connective tissue. So reticular layer, it's about 80% of the thickness of the dermis. So down here, the reticular layer, I guess I kind of switched them. A lot of collagen in there. Collagen's really strong. It's why you can't pull your skin off. And also elastic fibers so that your skin is stretchy. Then the papillary layer is made of a real or connective tissue. It's made of papillae. That's the name. So papillae are like bumps, like the bumps on your tongue or goosebumps are papillae. And then there's Meissner corpuscles and also free nerving endings that stick up in here and allow you to have some sensation of the skin. So that's dermis, hypodermis. Hypodermis, I guess, kind of just highlighting it there. Mainly composed of adipose, so fat cells, and then also a real or connective tissue. Technically, since it's hypo, it's below the dermis, it's not really a part of the skin. It's not technically skin. But main thing there is just storage of fat. Skin appearance, there's not too much to cover here. It's kind of interesting that your skin has these things called Langer lines kind of natural cleavage points in your skin and if a surgeon knows these cleavage points basically the skin will heal better so a surgeon will usually try to follow Langer's lines and not go across them because if you get a cut across Langer's lines the wound opens up a lot more and it's more difficult for it to heal skin color is mainly from three different pigments so melanin that's what gives us a tan or a yellowish to brownish color also freckles and pigmented moles are made of melanin Carotene, if you eat a lot of carrots, you really will turn orange. Obviously not orange enough to be an Oompa Loompa, but you will turn orange because of carotene. Hemoglobin gives us a reddish pigment. So not much there with skin color. Accessory structures, there's not going to be a whole lot here. We're going to do nails, hair, and sebaceous or glands, in general glands. So glands, two different types of glands. So the main two types of glands are sweat and sebaceous or oil. We do have two different types of sweat gland. We have eccrine glands which are found in the palm, soles of the feet, and the forehead. And then we have apocrine glands, which are found in the axillary area, so armpits, and anal genital areas, so pubic areas. These are the ones that tend to have more bacteria, and so they tend to produce more of a scent. Ceruminous glands, these are a type of apocrine sweat gland, but they tend to secrete wax. So think about your ears, earwax. Mammary glands are also sweat glands. Then you have sebaceous glands, these are the oil glands. They secrete an oily secretion called sebum. Probably, I'm gonna skip back here for a second. So in this picture, probably could have labeled these a little bit better. This is a sweat gland here. And these glands that are around hair follicles are sebaceous glands. So that's glands. I don't think we'll dwell too much on the structure of nails. They're just a modification of the epidermis. 
There are certain pathologies associated with it. You can get like clubbed fingers, but we won't go into that. Hair, keratinized cells. There's two different types of keratin. There's hard keratin, which is tougher. And then there's soft keratin. So hard keratin would be hair. Soft keratin would be the type of keratin that keratinized your skin. As far as structures of the hair, you have a lot of capillary beds in the skull of your head. And so the hair is actually protective. It maintains warmth, also prevents against physical trauma, and might alert you to the presence of insects so that that can't get to those capillaries. Might indicate personality. Again, I don't know that I need to read all these off because this is kind of simple anatomy. Hair is divided up into three main regions. The cuticle, which is the outer covering, the medulla, which is the very middle, and then the cortex is in between. Just another view of a hair follicle where you can see these sebaceous glands. Erector pili muscles will give you goosebumps or make your hair stand up. And then pore issues, might as well bring this up, is when you get an infection in there. If the infection's not open, it becomes a whitehead because there's no, inf there's no dirt or debris that gets down in there to blacken it. But if it's open to the surface, debris gets down in there, colors the pus darker, and that's when you get a blackhead. Types of hair, velus, really fine body hair found in children. Adult females, terminal hair is more the coarse hair, like of your eyebrows and scalp, armpits, and things like that. Conditions, alopecia is hair thinning. True baldness is genetically determined, so this is what we would think about when we think about male pattern baldness. So that's hair. Now we're going to get into cancer. And there's three main different types of cancer that affects the skin. Basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma. So most skin tumors are benign, don't metastasize or spread, but there are some that do. The key thing seems to be a gene called P53. What P53 does is it recognizes when the DNA has been mutated in a skin cell, or really all cells, and it's supposed to tell a cell to not go through mitosis. What's been found is people that have an erroneous P53, or P53 does not work very well, then cells that have been damaged don't self-destruct. They'll start to grow into a tumor cell, or they'll go through mitosis when they shouldn't. Three major types of skin cancer, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma. Let's go through those individually. Basal cell is the least malignant, but it's the most common. It affects those basal cells, or that basement membrane. Slow growing, doesn't really metastasize, doesn't grow deeper into the skin, so it stays superficial and it can be removed just by cut off surgically. Just another view shows also, I think what I'm looking at here is it tends to stay superficial. When it grows, it grows out as opposed to melanoma. When melanoma grows, it grows deeper in, which makes it more likely to reach blood and to metastasize. Kind of the middle of the road, clearly by looking at these pictures, squamous cell carcinoma is damaging. It's cancer of the keratinocytes. So scalp, ears, and lower lip grows rapidly and will metastasize or spread if it's not removed. Prognosis is usually pretty good. Another picture. So it shows here that this one is more likely to go deep, but since it's slow growing, it doesn't really metastasize strongly. So the worst of the worst is melanoma, cancer of melanocytes. Highly metastatic, and it resists chemotherapy. In order to determine whether you have a mole or it could be melanoma, it's very important to catch melanoma early because once it's about 4 millimeters, it's probably already metastasized. So there's something called the ABCDE, or sometimes E, rules. So asymmetry means that the two sides of the mole or cancer are different. So in this case, this is a mole because both sides are symmetrical. This one has a darker side on one side. It also is uneven. If we cut it down the middle, it's not a mirror image. In a mole, the border is kind of smooth. In cancer, and you can think about this as these are cells that are trying to grow, that it's a tumor that's trying to grow, and it doesn't grow evenly, so the border is irregular and has indentations. Also, because in melanoma, there might be increased melanocytes, or there's more cells in one particular place than others, you'll notice color variations. So if there's multiple different colors, it's probably melanoma. If it's one uniform color, then it's probably just a mole. Diameter, if it's less than four millimeters, which is about the size of a pencil eraser, it's probably a mole. If it's bigger than that, 
It's probably cancer. It's probably melanoma. Another one, some people say elevation, but this one is not really a good one because all moles will elevate over time. But other people say E is for evolution, so you see it changing or evolving over time. So those are the A, B, C, D, E's of skin cancer. And if you're a student of mine and you have a tanning tag on your keys, I'll always ask you, what are the A, B, C, D, E's of skin cancer? So again, asymmetry, border, collar, diameter, and elevation or evolution. This one's interesting because it shows that melanoma strikes men and women at different locations. So men are more likely to get melanoma on the face. Females are much more likely to get melanoma on the legs. Just another figure I pulled from Wikipedia that shows the depth that melanoma goes to. So kind of what's shown here is there's blood vessels down here. And if melanoma can get to a certain size, it'll get down to blood vessels and then it will metastasize. So if the melanoma is more than four millimeters thick, survival is really, really poor. So that's melanoma. Now we've got burns. Kind of mentioned already that there's different classifications. And if we look at Wikipedia, it kind of lays it out kind of nice. Did you have different types based on is it superficial? Is it deep? Or is it full thickness? So when we think about the layers of skin, superficial means it's only the epidermis. Moving more deep means it's going into the dermis. And then full thickness would be all the way through the dermis. You can even get further thickness by going down into the bone layers. Another way we break these down is first degree, second degree, and there's two different types of second degree, and then there's third degree and fourth degree. So you see the confusion. I think most often these days, the terms that are used are superficial, partial thickness, and full thickness. You can look at Wikipedia if you want to see more information on that. So let's just go through it kind of briefly. Partial thickness or superficial could be just a sunburn. Just goes through the first little bit of the epidermis. Partial thickness, second degree. Might see some blisters. Going to get down into the dermis a little bit. Upper dermis. Third degree. Full thickness is going to go through the entire thickness of skin. So it's going to go down through the epidermis and the dermis and reach the hypodermis. One last thing is when it comes to burns, if I asked you what the first threat to life is with the burns, you might say infection, because that's usually what people die of when they have a burn is an infection. But the first threat to life is dehydration because you have an open wound that's leaking fluid. So one of the quick ways to determine if a burn is critical or not, leaves you in critical condition or not, is to divide the body up into areas that are roughly equivalent to 9%. And if over 25% of the body has second degree burns, you've lost enough fluid to be in critical condition. If over 10% of the body has third degree burns, then you're in critical condition. So the way this works is we divide the body up into areas that are roughly nines divided by nines. So the head is 9%, the upper limbs are 9%, each leg is 9%. And then the question is, do you have over 10% third degree burns, over 25% second degree burns, then you'd be in critical condition. So if one lower limb was burned at third degrees, it would not be critical condition. If both lower limbs are burned at third degree burns, then you're over the 10%, and so that person would be in critical condition. If the whole trunk is burned to second degree burns, you're over the 25%, and so the patient would be in critical condition. So it's kind of a quick way to estimate, am I over that 10% threshold for third degree burns, or am I over that 25% threshold for second degree burns? So that's the rule of nines, and that's the integumentary system. Thank you.